Our next talk is from TT Games, who were voted the UK's number one studio in the 2012 Develop 100. TT Games are the developers behind the hugely successful Lego movie tie-in titles. So starting with Lego Star Wars in 2005, TT Games have gone on to produce Lego games starring Hollywood icons Indiana Jones, Harry Potter, Batman and Lord of the Rings. So here to talk about their work on the Lego series, please welcome to, to the stage TT Games animation directors David Brown and Philip Gray, as well as cinematic production manager Bill Martin. Thank you. Thank you. Um, just make sure you can hear me OK. Um, yes, hello. Um, first of all, I'd like to introduce myself. Um, I'm Bill Martin. I joined Tea Tales in 2005 as a lead animator. Um, during that time, since then, with the department's grown and all our cutscene production processes have, have kind of developed and become more complicated, I've got drawn more into an organisational role. So um, I'm now a cinematic production manager and look, overlooking all the, uh, all the cutscenes in different games, um, just making sure things are delivered for the team on time when they're needed um, and things delivered as needed. Um, but I still get to animate now and then, which is good. Um, Phil and Dave both joined TT about a year after me, um, and their first cutscenes were in uh, LEGO Star Wars games. And since then, they've both contributed um, in some way to all 14 of our LEGO games, whether it's been an animation direction or just suggesting gags involving um, vegetables or assorted animals. Um, Dave and Phil will be speaking more detail about cutscene creation from the director's point of, point of view. Um, and they'll be taking you th through some of the scenes from the latest projects. But I, what I'd like to do as an introduction is uh, explain some of the processes which go into creating cutscenes um, and how they've evolved over the years since about 2005, 2006. Um, the first LEGO games, which you might be familiar with, were um, these two. All the time through um, cutscene production, our uh, key rules are to keep them short because um, so, if you've been going through game, gameplay, all the action's really fast. We started doing cutscenes which were quite gently introducing a character, have them walk into a room, look around, do stuff, and we realized it was far too short, sorry, far too slow to, to match what was happening in game. So we soon learned that we needed to keep things snappy. Um, so we, we'd aim for a total duration of 45 seconds maximum, 10 seconds if we could manage it. And if it, if it was going over 45 seconds or so, we'd cut it down, try and keep in the gags, but keep the story um, clear so we'd move the narrative along, but set up the objective for the next bit of gameplay so it's clear what's happened, what you need to do next, and hopefully keep it funny and make it fun. So it's like a, a reward for reaching that part of the game. You watch a funny film, move on to the next bit. Um, another feature of all the LEGO games was that there was no dialogue. Um, so the animators had to uh, learn how to do all their acting through mime, um, broad acting uh, to express what was happening <coughs> with the, with the uh, characters and the storyline. And they, they got the hang of portraying a full range of emotions, um, you know, for anything from confusion, you might recognize some of these, um, surprise, uh, even anger, sometimes love, <laughs> more gently, affection, and in fact all kinds of affection, um, and of course terror, sadness, um, confidence, and also inevitably the complications of parental heritage. Um, <laughs> thankfully Polaroid did a lot of um, storytelling for us in a lot of our cutscenes, so we use them quite a lot, and in, in other games obviously we had maps and diagrams to help get the story across. So these are the basic principles that we always work to. <coughs> keep it clear, keep it brief, um, and hopefully keep it funny. And these are the same guidelines that we still um, work to even in the latest cutscenes now. So you need to have a quick drink. Being an animator, I'm used to people seeing what I do in a very detached way, so I'm really not used to talking to both people at the same time. Um, drawn storyboards have always been the first stage of every cutscene. Um, Star Wars, Indiana Jones and Harry Potter all have well-known stories and so we could take bits from those films, just adapt them to work with the, with the game narrative 
and, and people knew what was happening with them fairly easily. All the drawings were kept quite loose, so they could be whoops, drawn quickly, as you can see here. They could be drawn quickly and changed if they needed it. Um, often alterations were needed for timing and editing. Um, uh, Usually, we'd, a board would be drawn, certainly in this case, in these early days, um, boards would be drawn by the, uh, a character artist at the time. Um, and it would only be when we looked at what was happening in the actual game design, we'd realize changes would need to be made. So this one is, is the one where uh, Luke walks into Leia's cell. They see each other. Uh, they run outside, realize the stormtroopers are coming. She blasts the hole in the side wall, and they, they hop out. Uh, that did change quite a lot in the final game. We had, um, I think Dave directed this one and added a Chewbacca grabbing a bone to get him go down the hole. Um, he needed motivation, didn't he, really? Absolutely. For the hole. Yeah. And that was, that was to fit in with, with changes that were made as, as we went along. Um, this other example uh, is, is a better example. I can show you both sides. This is the original one. Um, ben and R2 and... Chewbacca, Han Solo, and, and Luke run into the control room. They look for where the princess, whoops, princess is hidden. Is that you? Um, <clears throat> see her on the monitor. Obviously, we could cut out stuff <coughs> that was put in the board just to scoop things along quicker. They see where she is, have a quick discussion, exit the room, and leave the droids in the, in the room by themselves. But as it turned out, gameplay required that Ben was in another part of the, uh, the Death Star, and just the three playable characters, Han, Luke, and Chewie, would be in the room. So again, Dave took this one. In game, they'd already run into the room, so we cut straight to the action. R2 plugs in. Do you think the revised ones make, meant to look like it, it makes more sense than the original one? But it doesn't, does it? <laughs> it uh, At first glance, it just looks like oh, a yeah, complete disaster. Yeah, because you're just, you're not, none of it is about um, nice drawings. Um, it's just getting the idea across clearly as to what was needed. Certainly for these, when the animators drew, drew their own boards, uh, it was all very quick and on the hoof. Quick decisions made with the director as to what they'd be doing. So we straight into the action see what the problem is, have a discussion about it, Ben exits, the, the droids just hid in the cupboard straight away, which left the playable characters in the room. And this was Dave's sketch, because this was done before we had the game level available. So when we knew what the room layout was, Dave could work out where to put the, where the exit was, where he could put his cameras to work with the exit and the cupboard where the droids were hiding. So that was kind of uh, the system for uh, a good few years. Um, you can see how Dave got a little bit bored towards the end on the last panel. You can see R2 looks like R2, and then at the end, you've no idea what's going no. on. It's quite questionable, isn't it? Quite professional. He's <laughs> not got much patience to No, not really. I think uh, they're good drawings. Yeah, they're good they've got they're a charm, good. haven't they? They're a charm. They're, they're a special charm. charm. So the emphasis on the boards was always to spell out exactly what was going to happen, how it would be framed, and what the time would be like, so the animators knew just what they needed to be doing. Um, so in those early days, in about... 2005, 6, and 7, um, the animators would often revise the boards. They'd also set up their own control rigs for characters. We'd have a reverse foot that was available to just apply to any character, but any special rigging for uh, IK on arms, we'd have to set up ourselves. <clears throat> They'd also place the cameras in the scenes and often make um, props for the characters to use. Then we'd send them to the level artist, and they'd make a proper version that would work, and usually had a different center and a slightly different size, so we'd have to bring them back into the scene and rework them. And we also did our own particle effects. I remember all those days fighting with a particle editor, trying to get a good effect in the cutscene. Usually it's something that works in game. We take it into our scene, adapt it a little bit if we had to. But we'd be hours spent in the particle editor, making things look good. Um, but each project, we realized where the problems were. And we'd improve to you know, make things more efficient for the next one. So over the years, from 2006 until now, We've produced cutscenes for quite a few games. This isn't all of them here, just a few of them are shown. And um, the, the department was growing, more animators being taken on board. And we also um, split up our teams into more specialized areas. So we, we had rigging animators who did nothing but create control rigs for the characters. We have a, a kind of a universal control rig for all the minifigs, which can be applied to any of them and copied, all the animations copied across usually. They usually work. And bosses obviously would need unique uh, 
control rigs, uh, technical animators to help the, uh, the animators with obviously technical issues like with uh, getting things working in game, objects that don't work, character problems. Um, the technical animators are always on hand just to help them out so the animators can concentrate on animation rather than overcoming all the technical problems which, of which there are many. And uh, a model team we have who just make vehicles and props. So now if we need special objects for characters to use, um, we just tell them what's needed, usually an hour or two later, sometimes the next day. Uh, we get a, a, a decent prop which they can use, and we know it'll be the same object that's used in game. And we also have a, an effects team who um, create all the particle effects. If they don't really exist in game, they'll adapt them to work in a cutscene just as we need. So, and also, of course, I get to bigger and bigger spreadsheets. I uh, don't have a picture of those, I'm afraid. <clears throat> so around this time, we also formed a story team, um, which consisted of three or four senior animators. And they would look at the key story points um, across the whole um, series of films, if it was the indie, in, two indie films or the Harry Potter stories, and decide which bits of story could be dropped out and which needed to be kept in for emphasis and they'd make it all fit in with the game design, because that's always the point, is to keep supporting what's happening in gameplay and hopefully make it entertaining at the same time. Um, most of the film franchises, particularly the later ones, involved quite complicated stories. So there are lots of interwoven threads, like in Pirates of the Caribbean or the double crossing in various films. And in Harry Potter, the latter films had lots of threads going on, which we, a lot of which we just ignored. I have a little nod to, perhaps, in a, a joke or a some, you know, small <laughs> reference. But um, a lot of it was stripped right down, so just to keep, keep the, the pace up. It's quite a dark time working in Harry Potter, wasn't it, really? And those later films, yeah. yeah. It's all death and dying. Um, and also, at this time, we took on some dedicated board artists who worked on all the games that you see here. Um, here's an example of their, their work. You can see that the drawings are much more clean. This particular um, board artist had quite a graphic style. We had others who were more um, sort of almost painterly with their stuff. We always encouraged them not to spend too much time making lovely drawings as long as they could portray the story. So they'd work with a director, we'd nail down just what's needed, and then this would be given to the animator and they could um, take it from there, really. Still, if they uh, found the game level was different to what was portrayed here, they'd have to make changes inevitably, even, even though we had a dedicated team. We still had animators producing their own boards like this. This is one of this is yours, isn't it? It's one of Phil's, which was drawn at last minute nice again. Nice yes. It's better than the other one. <laughs> it just, it's all the essentials that we need. Um, we had to get the characters into the level, show what the next peril was going to be, and then set them off. Um, and that's always been the, the point of board, is, uh, you know, just to explain exactly what's <coughs> happening, make it clear for the animator what's needed. Um, yeah. On the last few projects, <clears throat> we've moved away from drawn storyboards. Our board artists have been um, setting up uh, layouts or pre-vis scenes in Maya. So they've been learning all the skills of setting up characters and cameras in Maya, which gives us, um, it gives the animators a scene ready-made almost, because all the problems we come across after uh, doing a storyboard when we try to get into game we, we meet those in the, uh, the layout scene because we're using the game level. We can see where the characters are. We can see what cameras, uh, uh, characters and cameras are doing. Um, and they can work with a director with just a few layout artists. And then the scenes are ready for the animators to take on. There's, inevitably, inevitably, there are still changes to be made. But uh, it's a much more efficient process now that we're, we're developing. So I would have thought you're ready for some cutscenes now. Would you like to see some cutscenes? Yeah. Yeah. Good. Fine, yeah. good. So here's a few from some of those games. The, the first one is um, from one of the boards you've just seen. So the really observant ones might notice some differences to the board that you've just looked at. And we could be asking questions later.
Dave might do want to do a commentary on this one, possibly, as it was one that he directed, and there were lots of... Uh... <laughs> All the spot. <laughs> Yeah, with this, because uh, there's basically a wolf in a playground, we wanted to make it a bit more sort of kid-friendly, really, so we put him on a, on a roundabout, because I thought it was funny. Um, you can't really see that, but it is a, it is a kind of wolf. And then um, when the bus comes in, then he gets on. This is all pre-dialogue, so we just have to kind of... Um, Persuade people uh, what the story is, to tell them what the story is without it. Uh, this was an idea we had to, to sort of show off the Lego of it, really. In the film, the whole bus, I think, squashes. There's some kind of massive CG special effect, so we thought we'd, we'd break it up into bits of Lego and rebuild it, which is quite good fun. <laughs> Cut to game, except you didn't. No. We thought we cut to game then, and you went inside the pub, and, and you were going to play in the pub, and then someone said, someone in design decided that the actual start of gameplay was upstairs in the pub, so we had a whole other cutscene that we had to do after that yeah. to get you upstairs. When you think you finished. Yeah. Just when you think you finished, you've got yeah. another two weeks to go on it. Yeah. And this last one is another example of, of just the brief is just to get the characters from one position, they see the bat signal, and get them down onto the ground level. Um, to fight the villains and move on to the next bit of gameplay. So the animators <coughs> came up with some ideas of what they could do with it. Look at those dramatic poses. Absolutely. Who did that? Early days came <coughs> yeah. So that's, that's pretty much our overview of, of how our production process has evolved. Um, we've become more efficient. We've got more departments doing things to help support the animators now rather than uh, animators who do bits of in-game animation also doing cutscenes. We've got a dedicated team of cutscene animators uh, which grows and, and falls depending on how many projects we have at any one time. Um, and, and the emphasis is always still keeping it brief and funny and supporting the story. Um, okay, so now I'll hand you over to Phil, who's going to talk a bit more about um, the director's role with uh, some newer cutscenes from Batman 2. Thank you, Bill. Thanks, Bill. Bill Martin, everybody. <laughs> Thank you. Very good. Okay, uh, it's, uh, from Fountain, I Am I on? I'm on. Okay. Right. Hello, I'm Phil. Hi, thank you for that. <laughs> Hi, Phil. I'm an alcoholic. No, that's through the meeting. Right. Um, hmm. Pure morphine. Right. Lego Batman 2. No. Um, I started with um, Traveller's Tales in 2006, uh, pretty much with Dave on Lego Star Wars 2. And as Bill says, worked through those processes until uh, I've helped do stuff on story and direct cutscenes. Um, and Lego Batman 2 was the first game that I co directed with another chap um, starting about this time last year, I think we started work on it. The exciting thing about Lego Batman 2 was it was the first one that was scheduled for release that would have the Lego characters actually talking in. We had several of the projects that were possibly going to come out about the same time, but, but it turned out that um, the way things fell, it was that Batman 2 would be the first uh, ba Lego game that would have, from us anyway, that would feature talking characters. So um, that was quite exciting uh, and a little bit daunting because we'd spent the last six years getting used to holding up Polaroids or going, oh, uh, and things like that. Um, so it was going back to what we'd originally done when we were uh, sort of studying animation and working in other animation um, companies where you get a piece of dialogue and you'd go back to animating to the dialogue. Um, and that had a few issues, but 
we overcame them quite quickly. I think the team did really, really well adapting from a silent, essentially a silent department to a, a talky. They said transition was pretty quick, really, wasn't it? They did, the guys did a really good job. Um, and the turnaround on it was, like I say, was really quick on Batman 2. Um, let me just get, have a quick look at my notes. So I'll just quickly talk about this, and then we'll get to see some more cutscenes. Uh, one advantage of um, what, one advantage of the two Batman games that we worked on was that unlike the Indiana Jones and the Star Wars games, is uh, they were original stories. So we weren't having to rely on using um, existing, um, uh, what's the word, licenses or uh, stories or films. They were uh, standalone um, products. Uh, and with the first Batman game, the story itself was, um, was incredibly simple. It was just basically, uh, as Bill was showing you there, you recapture all of the villains from Arkham and you get them back. That's it. They escape at the beginning and you go through the game recapturing all of it. So from a story point of view, it was really simple to tell. And we didn't really have any huge uh, cutscenes that needed massive amounts of exposition, um, which uh, tended to happen a little bit more on Harry Potter, where, which had it, and Pirates. We had some really monster scenes in there where you have to try and get, a lot, get across a lot of information silently. So when we started on Batman 2, uh, and we had dialogue involved, um, uh, we could go to town a little bit more and make it a little bit more about the, uh, the characters and the uh, relationships between the characters and actually spend a bit more time having fun with who Batman was as a person and uh, his relationship with Superman, who features in Lego uh, Batman 2. Has anyone played Lego Batman 2? Show of hands, anybody? A few? So you, know, you sort of know about What's that? that a percentage? Is about percentage? 2%? 2%. It's all right. Isn't it? It's not bad. It's not a bad percentage. It's not the core demographic. It's not our core it? demographic, though. We're used to talking at um, primary schools, really, aren't hmm. we? That's uh, where we should go, really. Not anymore, though. Not no. since Dino. You know, the, no, no. the incident. <laughs> not, since, not since Bill brought his dog. Um, right, so the story for those, that's actually quite good because the story, for those who, uh, who don't know, about uh, Lego Batman. Oh, hang on. Who's played a Lego game? See? Look at that. That's Loads. good. That's better. That's good, isn't it? Batman's not been out that long, though, to no, be fair. That's so, good. You know, Most people, that's good. Most that's people good. have played a Lego game. That's good. Um, so, the story. So, going back to the word story. Story is something that we try and work on quite a lot now. We can have, have dialogue. And we have done over the last 12 months. Worked quite. Dave's going to talk a little bit more about that in his work on Lord of the Rings in a few minutes. Um, but one of the fun things we had to do with, um, with Batman is that we actually had a, a, a proper story in a more traditional sense of it has a, a, a development if you, in a very loose sense from the main character has a change by the end. And the story basically starts off with uh, Lex and Joker, Lex Luthor and Joker, uh, Joker, one name, just um, decide to work together to defeat their own, their opposite nemesises, their nemesi. Nemesis? Nemesis. Nemesis. Um, so Joker and Lex decide that they are going to work together to bring down their foes. And by doing, and by um, how they're going to do that is Lex has, uh, Lex needs Joker to create some, uh, create fake kryptonite for him, synthetic kryptonite, and Joker, and in return he gives Lex, he gives, Lex gives Joker a, a weapon that will be able to deconstruct Black Lego which is what all of Batman's vehicles and gadgets are made out of. So rendering them totally impotent and meaning that Lex and Joker can rule the world. So I'm going to quickly show it. So that's the overview of the story. Let me just show you the first. If you haven't seen this before, it's very exciting. This is the first. So as Bill was talking, a little bit touching on what Bill was talking about, we still have to work, obviously, with it's a story, but we still have to work within. Um, uh, we still had to work within the confines of the game. And even though we had all this dialogue, it's very tempting to stick massive cutscenes in with all this exposition in the middle of gameplay. And what we try and do, what we try and do is work with the designers. Uh, and it, works, it generally works really, really well, is that, we'll, that they'll say, well, what we kind of need to happen is this. And then they'll give it to us, and we'll sort of portion up the action accordingly throughout the game level. And then generally, as it's worked out with Batman 2, and in this case, 
is if there's a massive piece of exposition that we need to do, or in, as we found, which was great in Batman 2, was character development, is we'd stick it at the end of gameplay. So you'd do a big fight, you'd rescue Robin from some burning acid bath, and then, you know, while you're waiting, catching your breath, we'd try and put the bigger cutscenes, roughly about anything longer than a minute, we tend to view as a big cutscene. We tried to put them towards the end of the uh, action. So you've just done a bit of action, you just... Uh, escape from a burning chemical factory aided by Superman. So let's have a little look at this. So, who blew this up? Long story. We've got it covered. Okay, well, just let me know. Up, uh, volcano in Mexico. Call me if you need me. Uh, Batman, maybe he could help with this. I mean, he's had a lot of experience dealing with Lex Luthor. We don't need him. Well, it seems like just now we needed him. We would have been fine jumping off the roof. I think we would have broken our legs. We've broken our legs before. Yeah, but I didn't like it. I mean, if we just call him. Robin, we can't go through life expecting Superman or anyone else to save us whenever things get tough. The only people we can rely on is ourselves. Bat computer, tie in. Bat computer, remote tie in active. Access chemical database. What substance can be produced through a combination of the following chemicals? Promethium, xenon, mercury, tantalum, and dialin. Accessing. No substance found. What substance can be approximated through the combination of the chemicals? Accessing. Listed chemicals can combine to form an approximation of kryptonite. Kryptonite? We better call Superman. Not going to call Superman. Activate tracking systems. Detect nearby sources of kryptonite. Okay, I'll just stop it there. So as you can see, Batman doesn't really want any help whatsoever. Uh, and that was, um, that's kind of indicative of the, of the story of Batman throughout the game. Um, and that's quite, I mean, that's quite a long cutscene. And there's an awful lot of um, dialogue that, is, that we were asked to, to be used, but um, isn't really pushing along uh, the story or his character. So what we try and do in situations like that, or what we did in this case, is that we would uh, put something in the background that was a bit stupid, like Robin showing off to a fire fireman. Um, and then the dialogue's still there, so you can pick it up if you want. But we also, it goes back, because it was sort of a nice transition from working totally silently. The animators quite enjoyed just doing silly stuff like that in the background, which didn't really affect gameplay, but was quite nice to look at. So going back to Batman, what we what, with the, the character of Batman, um, you can see by his dialogue in that, or here by his dialogue in that, that um, Batman really, 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 really doesn't want Superman to help him in any way whatsoever. He also doesn't really want Robin to help him, but Robin is useless, and that's why he doesn't want him to help him. Um, and throughout the, um, it gets sort of worse and worse and worse. It, it, as, as the story progresses, the, their relationship gets worse, and, and uh, uh, we were trying to give a, um, when we, when, one of the problems you have when you try and direct a cutscene is to be as brief and as uh, concise as possible when describing what you want from the action with the animator. It's, it's quite frustrating if you sell them one thing and you can sort of fudge it a little bit and then you get the, get the sort of rushes back and you go, well, that's not quite what I meant. And I, can't, I wish I could remember who it, was, who it was came up with this way of um, summing up the relationship between... Batman, Superman, and Robin, but it was a great way. It was a really nice piece of shorthand for their relationship as the game went on. And the, the, the relationship was this, is that Batman is a dad. Batman is dad, and he's got a job to do. He's got to go out and fight crime. Robin is his son, who he's taken to work with him that day. Um, and he's a bit, he wants to help, but he can't help. And Superman is a cool uncle, who for, for which everything is really, really easy, and who Batman thinks is a really, just a pain in the bum. So once we got this idea that it was this sort of um, th uh, the, the son, dad, uncle kind of relationship, it really did click and it made that the, the animators gave them something to pin their ideas to as a, a, throughout all of the scenes and as a, as a constant thread. And it, it really helped keep the animation consistent in little tiny nuances, especially in Batman, as he gets up, because he can't really ever go crazy, Batman. He's always sort of quite it's boiling all the way under the surface. When he does explode, it's just always quite contained. And the animators had a really good time with um, sort of trying to keep him sort of locked down. So I'm just going to show you now um, another. As the story progresses, um, it turns out that, uh, that 
Jerker need, LX needs kryptonite for some, missed some super weapon, uh, and Batman has been tricked into letting them into the Batcave, and then they trash the Batcave. And Batman keeps a source of kryptonite, uh, a store of kryptonite in the Batcave, just in case Superman ever goes bad. Just in case. Just in case, because you never know. Is that so, true? Is that to, just to do with this story, or is that, is that factual in terms of the Batman? The Batman can. Do you know thing. what? I don't know. I don't know. So, I, I imagine it's the kind of thing he would do. Because if it goes bad, what do you do? Just wondering. He know. needs kryptonite. Um, so this is this is another again. This is after this is a bit of dialogue. Another bit of this is a lengthy exposition piece. Dialogue just after the Batcave's been trashed. Hey Batman, I think I fixed the whirly bat. <laughs> I'm. I'm gonna go work on the back boat now. Why didn't you tell me Luthor was involved? I was handling it. Yeah, looks like you had it all under control. Look, I'll hang around and give you a hand. Remember, I can do anything. You know what was in there? What? Kryptonite. That's what they wanted the whole time. Must be what powers that deconstructing device. I picked up kryptonite on the Batmobile scanner. So now they can neutralize your gadgets and my powers. Question is, why? What are they up to? I don't know, but we need to get that kryptonite. We can take this to get there. Introducing the new flying Batboat. You need a hand? No, I'm good. So again, we had a little bit of exposition there and some nice, so a little bit, and, uh, and also some nice humor, uh, which was brought from the dialogue. Um, so let's check my notes. So again, yeah, the story's been advanced there. You, the, 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 you, you as the player know kind of what's going on, but Batman and Superman are still playing catch up. And as it emphasizes there, they can neutralize our powers now. Uh, and just mention briefly about one of the problems we had all with, with Superman as a character is um, if you've got somebody who can do anything, then you, you have to be able to do that in gameplay. Otherwise, it's really frustrating. If you've got Superman who can basically do anything, if you can't do that in gameplay, it's really annoying. So what the, te what the designers sort of came up with is, is a way of you play him, in, I think, uh, very briefly as, as Superman. But from now on in, because Kryptonite's on the table, Superman is weakened, and he is, he is not as strong, and he can't do everything. And it makes it a little bit more fun to play, because if you can play as this sort of godlike character, then you know, there's no challenge to it at all. So that was an interesting sort of where that developed, is the Kryptonite helped the design in, in the gameplay. And if you play after this, I think the next level after this one is when he gets exposed to a massive amount, and he can no longer fly, for <coughs> example. And then the longer he's exposed to it, his powers become less and less until eventually he's totally redundant. But because he's a hero, he still is going to go and take it to the man and Lex Luthor. And this was a nice example. I wanted to show this scene because this was a nice example of um, Superman and Batman when they figure out that Lex Luthor is behind it all. They go to Lex Tower, which is this big le building in the middle there. And um, they need to, they, 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 they're going to try and make, get an appointment to see Lex Luthor. Um, and this was an intro, so it's quite a short scene, but it was a really nice way of um, using the dialogue to create some sort of fun, snappy stuff. Oh, after you. Uh... We're here to see Lex Luthor. And you are? Seriously? Seriously. I'm Superman. He's Batman. Are those last names? Even his receptionist is evil. Just one name each, like Madonna. Oh, I see. You're down here. Mr. Luthor is expecting you. First elevator. Huh? 
She was a robot the Cut whole to time. Cut to game. Cut to game. Into game. Brilliant. Straight into the gameplay. So that was a really nice scene to work on because it, 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 you couldn't have done that with Polaroids and it just had some really silly one word jokes like Madonna. I think it's, it's great. It's, it's just a really nice little funny use of dialogue in a, in a, in a cutscene. So, so they see Lex Luthor um, and there's all this mad exposition, uh, really long cutscenes about what they're going to do. And it turns out that what Lex Luthor wants to do is Lex Luthor is wanting to become the president of America. And he does this with this enormous, I've heard this early, I'm, I went off too early. This is the Joker bot. This is the thing that is powered by kryptonite and has a larger version of the deconstructor ray on its arm. And Lex and Joker are in the head, all the way at the top. And there's a really, thank you very much, my lovely assistant. So that's where Lex and Joker are. So there's this big thing where they find out that's how they're going to do it. That's how the, the heroes find out that's, that's what Joker and Lex have been planning all along. And they're powerless to stop them. So there's a bit of a standoff. It looks like all is lost for the heroes. But like all, here, like all good stories, there's a little bit of a twist. I won't tell you what the twist is. You have to go and buy the game. <laughs> but suffice to say, they take the fight again to Lex. They follow Lex and the Joker robot to City Hall. And in gameplay, you fight against. This is a really nice level, actually. You fight the City Hall is down in the front, and you've got this enormous. Anyone who's a big fan of the sort of the Godzilla monster movies of Japan in the 60s will love it because this is just enormous robot, and you and you've got to fight it on the top of City Hall. And, it, and it eventually you then go off to fight it in the city. And it's a really nice sort of section, sort of sequence of gameplays. But after this bit, you've just, fit, you've just fought the Joker robot to a standstill. You've knocked out this big flower is a big gas dispenser, which, jerk, which Lex is using to brainwash the voters into voting for him. And you've just done that. But the Joker bot is still a very real threat. They're going to take off. I've got some of my strength back. Kryptonite. I'll slow them down, Batman. It'll be up to you to stop them. This time, Lex, I'm going to pull Batman apart. Literally. Stop it. Robin, great job. What? <laughs> Think I'm going to cry? Get going. So, as you can see, that's a nice little bit of um, uh, sort of the pay again. The development of the story there is that Batman's realizing that he needs, he does need help after all, and Robin's come through with the multicolored Batmobile. Crazy. Which is not affected by the deconstructor because it only works on black Lego. Brilliant. Brilliant. So Robin sort of saves Batman here, but the, it's not over yet. What At about this the tires, point, though, Phil, what about the tires? The tires. What about the, the tires? Tires are black, aren't they? Uh, yeah, it's uh, well, They're dark grey. They're dark grey. They're dark, dark grey. Yeah. They're uh, they're navy, um, <laughs> but it doesn't work on rubber either. Right. So um, okay. <laughs> <laughs> thanks, Dad. So as you can see, the dialogue again is here has helped. Um, again, it's really, really funny. The, 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 the Robin bit is uh, it's one of my favourite bits in the film. The, the, the look on his face is um, it's, it's fantastic. And so at this point, Batman is realising that he do, maybe he does need help. And maybe he can't take out the, um, the Joker bot, even with Robin's help and Superman taken out. So in the next bit of gameplay, I'm just going to end with this one now. Um, so Dave, because otherwise Dave's not going to have any time to talk about the very exciting new project. Another, um, exciting, new another exciting new project. So this is so Batman. Um, Batman realizes that he uh, he needs help. He needs to call for help, um, and to do that, and also to introduce um, some more exciting characters into the game. Uh, he has lured the Joker bot in a chase around Gotham City, all the time leaking out kryptonite. Um, and at one point, Batman Robin goes, "He's gaining on us. He's catching us." And he goes, "I'm not trying to lose him." And you think, "Oh, what's he trying to do?" How is, how is this some part of some kind of super plan? 
Where have you been? Getting some help. Look. Well, Batman! Any last words? Yeah. Look, you're on TV. Oh! It's beautiful! It's also visible from space, you idiot! Calling all Justice Leaguers. 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 What do you want to do? Well, I do despise Bruce Wayne. So as you, that's the superhero roll call. The next game level, you get to play as most of the Justice League that called. So it was a really nice way of showing off. I mean, the superhero roll call thing was something that we really wanted to do at some point in the game. And it was really nice that we get to do it. I think it's about two levels before the end. You get to start playing as all of the other assembled Justice Leaguers. And Superman's dropped out. So it's, it's a really nice sort of weather design um, sort of played out there. And as you can see at the end, the, the, the next bit of the next, he sort of indicates the next bit of gameplay is the Joker bot is going to destroy Wayne Tower. So I'm going to end my talk there. Um, and that was just some of the stuff that we did on, on uh, the, first, um, the first sort of talky that we did as a, as a, as a team. Um, yeah, so I'll hand over now to Dave, and he's going to wow you with some, I think some, they've got some exclusive. Well, if you've not bought the game in America. Phil um, Gray, everyone. <laughs> So, Lord of the Rings. Um, it was a long-awaited title. Um, a lot of people in the studio want, really wanted to work on Lord of the Rings, even before it had, had been agreed to be uh, Lego. And it was just one of those things that everyone said, oh, Lord of the Rings, that would be a fantastic franchise to work on. Um, and there were a lot of fans waiting for it as well. So I, I hope it's well received by everyone. Um, it could have been a very complicated story in the uh, sort of Harry Potter and Pirates of the Caribbean type mould, um, but what do I do here? I know what I do, I do that. Put that on, put a big picture on to start. Um, yeah, it could have been really complicated um, because there are quite a lot of, there are quite a lot of uh, stories that weave around the central story of getting rid of the ring. Um, but the story was simplified right from the start um, because we wanted to be able to tell the story concisely um, and sort of create a, a new adaptation of the whole story, really. Um, so the way, um, the way that design did it, um, we sat down and I sat down with, with John Burton about a year ago after he'd worked out the path of the game um, and we worked out where the cutscenes would be. Um, and the story, like the movies, is quite linear um, until the point where Frodo and Sam split away from, I presume, some people will know the story of Lord of the Rings and some people won't, but until Frodo and Sam split away from the rest of the party and then you've got basically two threads. Um, and we, we wanted to kind of keep it like that so that you could, you could split between Frodo and Sam and you could come back and play as Aragorn and Legolas and Gimli and do their bit of the adventure. And the, at some points the, 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 the adventures would kind of cross over and at some point they'd be, they'd be very separate. Um, so, yeah, I had very basic notes um, on what was going to happen at different points in the game, and, and the notes on the original design document would be something like, for example, Pelennor intro um, shows orcs, etc., attacking Minas Tirith, big battle level ensues. And that was it. So I got to work with that line and turn that into a bit of the story rather than just, just, just literally doing that, which would last about five seconds. But... Um, so it wasn't a lot to go on, but um, after that, um, we had quite a free reign to sort of adapt the story how we wanted to do it. Um, and these notes are kind of expanded throughout the project. Um, and we ended up adding certain details. We had extra shots, um, depending on the design requirements. But the story arc was, quite, was fairly well there from the start. Um, I mean, this was good on the one hand, because it made for a simpler story for a younger audience. Um, 
But on the other hand, it was, it was, it, it, it was quite complex because we, we had to adapt it sort of properly to make sure everything made sense and all, all the loose ends tied up. Um, the humour was meant to be very subtle right from the start. We didn't want to go overboard with it and we didn't want to um, take the mickey too much out of the characters or the situations. We wanted to keep it quite straight in a way. Um, we did have an idea quite early on when one of the first sets of scenes we were doing was the Moria scenes um, where, where Gandalf's fighting with a Balrog. Um, and one of the animators suggested having um, Gandalf standing on the bridge when he does his You Shall Not Pass speech dressed in a lollipop man outfit. So you cut to him <laughs> and he's standing there in day glow sort of outfit. And so we kind of, I, I was looking for this because I was going to show it you and I couldn't find it. It doesn't exist. It's been eradicated from the project somewhere. So uh, but I was going to bring that, but that was, that was rejected right from the start. So we kind of knew where, we kind of had a, an idea from the start as to how far we could, could or couldn't go. I mean, there are quite a few daft moments in it where it is pretty silly. There's some pretty silly stuff with the riders of Rohan who come in um, doing some formation dancing, which is quite cool. Um, but uh, yeah, so, so we didn't want to go too silly with it. Um, uh, what was I going to show here? Um, yeah, the dialogue tests, that's what I was going to... What? Wrong mouse, wrong mouse. Oh my God, what, where's the thing? Dialogue tests, yeah. Um, we were talking about dialogue before, or Phil was, and um, I mean, this was being made, developed at the same time as, as Batman 2, um, and there was some debate over whether or not we would, we'd be doing dialogue and whether we would take the dialogue, because we've actually taken the dialogue straight from the films um, and edited that together in a, in a way that still makes sense, uh, even though it's not just ripped straight from the film. So we did this task. <laughs> Mountains, Gandalf, yeah. and then find somewhere quiet where I How do I do the volume? Oh, so you mean to go through with your plan then? Yes, yes, it's all in hand. All the arrangements are made. So. I want to see mountains. I mean, this isn't in the film, uh, in the game. And then find somewhere quiet. It was just a little test we did. With, um, with a couple of. So you mean to go I think that's Dumbledore, plan. actually. Yes, yes, Harry it's all in hand. All the but, um, made. That they were like sort of just test characters. Um, but we, we realised that the, the characters, that, that the Lego minifigs inhabited, the characters inhabited the minifigs, um, even though it's, it's Ian Holm doing his lines and um, Ian McKellen, that, that they kind of, they become those characters. Um, the other thing we decided to change was um, the aspect ratio, which I'm always going on about. Mountain. But what we decided to do is instead of traditionally use a 16-9 frame, um, and we thought like the films, we'd like to, to do the more widescreen 235 to 1 framing, which takes the top and the bottom off uh, the picture and makes it, I think, a more immersive experience for the viewer uh, and uh, allows you to have all those, those sort of very cinematic um, moments. Um, so what I was going to do is is show you the process um, for, for creating these cutscenes. Um, Bill was saying before about how we used to use storyboards, and we still use storyboards a bit. If there's, if there's bits of the story we need to tell that aren't featured in the, in the movies anywhere, we'll stu still do that, and we'll still create layouts. Um, but what I really wanted with this, with this game is to have the real feel of the movies. So, um, I went through and just ed basically edited the movies together to create new sequences um, that we would then turn into layouts and we would then get animated. Um, so what I thought is I'd just show you um, a couple of examples of these things from the game. Um, the first one I've got is Brie, the scene in Brie when they go to the pub. Now, um, this scene triggers when you, when you enter the Prancing Pony in Brie. Um, the, the basic point of the scene is to pick up Aragorn as a new playable character. So all our scenes, like Phil was saying, are, are based around the game design and then the story is sort of informed by that. So what we have to do is, is take in um, the points from the design and we need to take in the points from the story and then we take in any other points that we think are relevant. And if things aren't funny, we try and make some humour out of it because otherwise you find that you're just sort of telling the story and that's all very well, but it, it, it can get a bit kind of tedious, especially if, 
if you've got a story that people are very familiar with, like Star Wars or, or Lord of the Rings or something where people kind of know what's going on, you, you're trying to inject something new to it all the time. Um, you said yesterday as well that um, part of it is you, you want to make a cutscene that you don't want to skip. Yeah, that's right. So. That's right. And you don't want to skip it, but you, you want to keep the story involved with the player as well. So you want to start with the player, you take them out of the play world, and then you want to throw them back into it and, and keep them feeling like they're part of the story. Um, so what I'll do is I'll, I'll just show you the, the kind of edit that I did. Excuse me. Good evening. Hello. Friends of Gandalf the Grey, can you tell them we've arrived? Gandalf? I've seen him for six months. What do we do now? Something for the road. Yeah. I can get you out. You get it. Um, yeah, so that was it really. Um, it was just, I was just to show you kind of what we did on that one. Um, and uh, yeah, that was kind of it really. Um, and I'd got, I had got another one. I'll show you. Show um, another one. Shall I show them the eye down? No, no, no. Show, show Palano. Show them the Palano one. Palano. I think I should show them the, um, the movie bit first. No, no, just show, just show the, the cuts. <laughs> Quite an interesting scene to do because, because this scene takes place over about an hour in the film. It keeps cutting back to it and it cuts back to other stuff. So again I just wanted to I just wanted to turn this all into one kind of scene just to set up the gameplay rather than cut away to other things. really need all these shots. I mean, you could just have that shot and it shows you what you've got to do because you then go into gameplay and you're on, on the 
back of a horse. But we wanted to have all those shots with people who would be expecting to see 75,000 orcs, as it says in the script, Peter Jackson's script. So, so we really wanted to get all that stuff in. And the same with all those fantastic lines from um, Bernard Hill. We wanted to get all that stuff in there. Yeah. Um, so we couldn't really help it but, but do all that stuff. Um, anyway, um, there's about one minute's worth, if, if that. Have we got any questions? Are we too late now? Right. Round of applause for a minute.